Tonight on The Hinckley Report, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump faced off in the first debate of the general election. 84 million viewers tuned in, making it the most watched presidential debate in history. It was a night of zingers and claims that kept fact checkers working overtime. Who won? And how did Utahns react? Tonight, we are talking presidential politics and Utah's role in the national political drama. Gary Herbert holds a sizable lead over Mike Weinholz in the race for the governor's mansion. In last Monday's debate, the candidates sparred over issues ranging from marijuana. I think there is a need for research and to see if we can in fact have it as a controlled substance as a, a use for medicinal purposes. I stand with the 71% of Utahns who are in favor of legalizing medical cannabis. To public lands. Did the debate sway Utah voters? Mia Love has extended her lead over Doug Owens in the 4th Congressional District. Can Love maintain this momentum until Election Day? Finally, who could have predicted that the closest race in Utah would be for president? We will answer these questions and more by diving into a recent Hinckley Tribune poll. Good evening and welcome to the first ever broadcast of the Hinckley Report a weekly roundup of the most pressing political issues and how they relate to Utah. Our aim is to elevate the dialogue surrounding elections, government, and the policies impacting our state. We are thrilled to be partnering with KUED on this important effort. We are also grateful for the esteemed panelists that are here with us today. Covering the week, Jennifer Napier Pierce, editor of the Salt Lake Tribune, Lisa Riley Roche, political reporter for the Deseret News, and Glenn Mills, chief political correspondent for ABC4 News. The first three de presidential debates took place on Monday and over 84 million people have a distinct opinion about who won. The first rule of all debates is that you declare victory no matter what, and both candidates are clearly doing that. Lisa, in the eyes of Utahns, who won that debate? Well, it, it wasn't Utahns. Utahns wanted to see something that would, would change their minds about these candidates. Neither are popular here. I talked to a lot of people before and after the debate. NBC's Chuck Todd told me that what was really going to be important for both of them, for Trump, showing that he had the temperament to be president, mm -hmm and for Clinton showing that she could be trustworthy as president. And we really didn't see either of those goals achieved mm -hmm. in, in the minds of a lot of uh, people here that watched. Trump, uh, Donald Trump Jr. had told me uh, ahead of time his father would just be himself, and boy, that's sure what we saw. Do you With, think, I think he was a little more restrained than usual. He was more restrained initially, but with 51 plus interruptions with uh, some of the rambling answers and some of the uh, uh, tone that he took with his opponent, I, I think we did see the, the real Donald Trump, the one that, that Utahns just don't like. So as a result, I don't think Trump has done what he needs to do to convince those Utah Republicans and conservatives that he's okay to vote for. But I'm not sure Clinton moved the needle either among those Utah voters who wanted a, a more liberal candidate in Bernie Sanders and just aren't sure she's, she's for them either. Right now, do you think we'll see a lot of going back and forth in the state of Utah anyway? Don't you think a lot of people are probably set on the candidate they're going to vote for, and regardless of what happens over the next few debates in the state of Utah, it probably isn't going to change much anyway. Well, that, that's the, the thing in Utah. Trump is ahead in the polling, uh, but he hasn't broken 40%, which for a right. Republican in Utah is, is pretty amazing. We have about a third of the voters in recent polls that either want another candidate, the Libertarian, the Independent, or just don't know is a, is a preference. So we may not see a lot of movement there, and that's affecting all the down ticket races. Well, let's, let's talk about the movement for just a moment. Jennifer, maybe you can talk about this. Um, as we see the polls kind of hovering around the same area almost every time for the last several months, many are speculating there's sort of a, a hidden vote in the state of Utah that it's not really uh, acceptable these days to tell your neighbor who you're voting for. So maybe we're not, maybe we're not proselytizing very much who, uh, who we're really going to vote for. So uh, is there a hidden vote out there? And if, if there is, uh, what are we going to see on election day that we're not seeing right now? 
I, I'm not convinced that there is a hidden vote. I, I think that maybe people are just keeping it close to the vest at this point, but I think people will come out and, and express their preferences. So um, if by hidden you mean that they're just not speaking publicly about it right now, maybe a little bit of that. But I mean, when you look at the poll numbers, there aren't that many undecided voters in Utah anymore. So I think people are gravitating to mm -hmm. camps. We're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of support for third party candidates because people just really don't like the two major party candidates in Utah. I do think because of that, though, there is a sense of I'm not going to say that I'm voting for Donald Trump right now because I don't want to be viewed of backing a lot of the things that he's out there doing. So I do think there are some closet uh, Trump supporters here in the state of Utah. And I also do think when it really comes down to it on election day, it's going to be really interesting to see how it goes. Right now, polls are showing anywhere from, what, 9 to 15 percent in the race right now. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out on election day. But I do really think that even though a lot of people are saying right now, I can't stand him, I can't stand her, when they really get in the privacy of their own homes, they're looking at the ballot and they're deciding, okay, what's important to me, the Supreme Court? taxes, spending. Once they get to that point, I think a lot of people are going to have an easier time saying, okay, I do not like this other stuff. I'm not going to say publicly that I like this other stuff, but these core values, who's going to represent me more? And I think there's going to be a, a bigger shift on election day I, I because of that. I actually disagree because I think that there, if there are closet voters, it's closet Hillary supporters because Republicans are they're just embarrassed by what their their party has become. And so I think that if if a Republican goes into the ballot, they're going to be like, oh, I really can't see him as presidential, and I'm going to go with Hillary. One of the effects we may see, though, is is straight party ticket voting, which which we do have in Utah. Uh, a lot of that will diminish this time, though? Well, I mean, no, a lot of Republicans have told me that that's going to be the out for the Republican conservative voter who goes to the ballot box and really cannot, in good conscience, check Donald Trump, but they can check all Republicans and walk away feeling like I, I did what I could. Let's remember, too, that in, in this debate, the, the two key issues here in Utah, Trump's position on immigration, uh, his statements that he would uh, ban all Muslims from entering the country, a, a statement at one point, those are things that have really turned off Utah voters. That did not come up in the debate. The Supreme Court, as Glenn mentioned, very important for a lot of Utah voters. I think people who are uncomfortable with Trump, if, if they heard from Clinton some reassurance about the types of justices she would appoint, that might, might make it easier for them to cross over. But uh, again, that wasn't uh, discussed in depth either. So we need to hear more of those things and, and those types of issues when they come up, as, as I expect they will in the two upcoming debates could well shift things a little bit, shake things up a little bit. Just one more thing to Jennifer's point. You may be right. People, Republicans in Utah may get to the point where they say, I cannot vote for Donald Trump, but I would be surprised if they say, I'm going to vote for Hillary instead. I think those votes will more than likely go to a McMullen or a Johnson than they would to a Clinton. Hmm. Do you think uh, these third party candidates, Glenn, have a chance of disrupting this election, maybe Utah or in other places? Right now, it doesn't appear like that's going to happen. Even in the state of Utah, it appears that the third party candidates are pulling equally from both candidates, right? Uh, so, and obviously, you know, this is McMullen's home state. And from what I've seen in the polls, it appears that he has picked up the undecideds and not necessarily drawing from either Trump or Clinton. So it does not appear at this point that that's going to happen. One of the things the debates do is, is present the choice between two candidates. Mm -hmm. N none of the third party candidates qualified, obviously, to participate. So seeing, then, seeing this debate, seeing the aftermath of this debate, the lead up to the vice presidential debate, and then the next two reinforces you pick one or the other. Interesting. Let, let's get on to that next debate that we referenced here just a moment ago. Je Jennifer, this is a different format. This is a town hall debate, which is not like what you have with the normal moderator that we've seen in the first one. How are the candidates going to prepare for this one? I don't know. I, I actually think I expect more of a spectacle this time because um, we have seen in uh, Donald Trump's rallies, mm -hmm. he has no problem calling out security and you know calling out people and saying haul them off. So um, I don't know if he's going to be on his best behavior there. I mean, he did say in this first debate that he was holding back a little bit. He didn't want to get too personal with uh, Chelsea Clinton. So maybe that restraint is just going to fly open. Do you think he did hold back? 
I think he probably had something up his sleeve. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I. Well, the, the preparation has been a big question. You know, uh, his, his campaign said we didn't prepare as much because people love the off the cuff, kind of the outsider approach that doesn't answer like someone that's been in he, the system. He brought that up himself in the debate. Remember, he criticized her for staying, staying home the last week when she was in intensive debate prep, which is typical. Uh, I, I saw one columnist from the Washington Post suggest this, is, this was like the biggest job interview for the best job you're ever going to have. And what do you do? You prepare. But yet Donald Trump chose not to, even though he had uh, plenty of people trying to help him with debate prep. He had plenty of people in the party trying to push him toward that, understanding yeah. what it means, down ticket, if you have your, your candidate... Uh, doing the things he's been doing since the debate, uh, focusing on issues that aren't substantive policy issues, but about his feelings on the former Miss Universe's weight, for example. And he's that's what we were really talking about the next few days was that controversy compared to everything else. And that's uh, in line with what we've seen this whole election season, right? We're not talking about the issues. We're talking more about the controversy. And that's why I think if, if there had been a third party candidate, Hillary and that third party candidate will be discussing the finer policy points and then Trump would jump in and do what he does. Uh, I think it would have uh, diverted some of that um, harder mm -hmm. attention from him. Well, let's talk about that harder attention that you mentioned because in the town hall debate, uh, these are actual questions from real voters. You can't really just ignore the question like maybe you could Lester Holt in the first debate, right? You kind of have to look them in the eye and answer them. And if that's the case, Glenn, how do you, how do you handle that if You've not had to go right to substance for some time. Well, this has really been a problem with Donald Trump all along. He has uh, public fights with uh, Gold Star families, military families, the average person. That's what he really needs to avoid this debate, in my opinion. He needs to treat uh, the people that ask him the questions with respect and get into that. And I think that's really something that he has to watch out for this time. He cannot afford to come off as fighting with general public Americans, average Americans once again, because it's really hurt him. The times when we saw his polls dip the lowest was the times he was engaged in those public fights mm -hmm. with average Americans. That's his brand. Uh, he's, he's the billionaire who can reach every man, right? That's how he's portrayed mm -hmm. himself on the campaign trail. And this is his opportunity to show that he can connect with these blue collar type voters that he, he claims are behind his candidacy. Mm -hmm. And so we'll so, see. So how does he keep that balance while doing what Glenn just said, which was he's gotta be somewhat reserved, can't be a, attacked uh, directly as he sometimes wants to do. How does he walk that line while, while still accommodating that base that loves it when he does that? We've gotta see what his advisors can, can uh, focus him into doing in, the, in that situation, because th that's the thing, with Trump, all bets are off. You just don't know what you're going to get. And the one thing you said in your last question was every man. I think women have a very different perception, and I think that uh, Hillary Clinton really scored some points when she pointed out his previous statements of calling women pigs, dogs, mm -hmm. slobs. I mean, um, that just really hit home for a lot of women, that this, it, it's jarring, and especially to see when he continued, how many times, 50 plus times interrupting her. I mean, I think any woman who has sat in a corporate boardroom <laughs> knows what that is going on. You know, it's, it's really, um, it's personal, it's visceral when you see that happening to another woman. And that's the one of the major voter groups he has so much trouble with, yeah. our women. Yeah. And he right now is really the only one proclaiming that he won this debate, right? Consensus is, is that Hillary Clinton won. So even though he's projecting this, I did well, I did what I wanted to, ABC News is reporting behind the scenes. His campaign put the Rocky performance solely on him, and I'm pretty sure he's going to take this advice and try to do better in the next one. And I think even Fox News gave him a C. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so let me ask really quickly about the role of media, since you all are part of that, uh, that, that demographic here. And sometimes they say the debate is important, but the reporting on the debate is maybe even more important. I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, but we are seeing the press come out, not only rating this debate, but some cases like USA Today coming out with a definite 
idea about who uh, America should vote for. What is the appropriate role for media, uh, Jennifer, uh, when it comes to the reporting of these debates? Actually, uh, well, I, I was going to come from the editorial position because this is a new space for me. As a reporter, you don't give your opinions, but as part of a, an editorial board, now I have to form opinions, yes, and a, a key component of that is endorsements and you know, I, I think that media are doing as much as they can to be truth tellers. I mean, that is our obligation. Um, and he makes it really hard because inaccuracy after falsehood, after lie, come out of his mouth. I mean, he, we have videotape that <laughs> he has said certain things and he will just flat out deny it. So it makes it really tough, I think, on journalists to... Um, do that fair and balanced, you know, we want to show both sides, but it makes it really hard on, on reporting him fairly. Glenn, Glenn, how do you feel about newspapers coming out the way like USA Today did? Newspapers coming out? I mean, that's a tradition in, in the newspaper realm, right? Um, it's always been a little strange for me because it like you say as a journalist my my goal is to be objective tell one side of the story tell the other side of the story and then let the viewer make up their mind it's always been a tradition of newspapers to do it but on the television end that's something that we obviously don't do is is uh, endorse candidates Thank and you, not all newspapers endorse the desert right. news mm -hmm. does not uh, I, just anecdotally, I cannot think of an election or an issue that I've covered in, in my 30 plus years as a journalist that has generated more comment from the public. And every, every time I write a story with the words Donald Trump in it, I get two kinds of responses. One, how dare I favor him? And two, how dare I criticize him? So uh, there's You're a doing real a fine job. Then, <laughs> well, thank you. you. As an editor, balance. I always yeah. appreciate hearing that. I agree with that. I see the same thing. Anytime we do a story on Donald Trump, it gets a lot of attention. People want to know what what to believe about him. They want to know what Clinton really has to offer. They want to get beyond just mm -hmm. the sound bites and the headlines and these really distractive issues that take up so much energy in this race. We're going to get to that point in just a minute as we talk about the polls too. So we're going to move to the, to the next section, uh, with the, which was some polls that have been coming out across the state of Utah, and particularly the Hinckley uh, Tribune poll that was just uh, completed, which covered issues ranging from candidate favorability to the economy. Glenn, I want to talk about the gubernatorial race for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, we polled on, the, on what happened in that debate, but we all also got a chance to watch these two candidates for the first time really going after each other. In Utah, Governor Herbert is a ahead of uh, Mike Weinholz by about 38 points going into that, that debate. How do you think these candidates fared? Well, that's a huge gap to start off with and one that is uh, you would look at and would say is unsurmountable at this point. However, that debate was everything that the presidential debate wasn't. It was a good-spirited uh, interaction between two candidates. And at the end of the day, you could definitely say, you know what, I have a clear choice in this race because they talked about the issues uh, you mentioned at the top of the show, uh, you know, medical marijuana being one of them, education, health care, Medicaid expansion. They got into the issues mm -hmm. and clearly painted differences between the two candidates. Uh, it was a good debate. At times it got heated, but it was still also respectful throughout the, throughout the uh, hour. Lisa, you, you cover these things closely, and I know you did for this debate as well. Uh, what were your takeaways from the debate? Well, I, I think Glenn is absolutely right that this was a civil, respectful debate that uh, both candidates clearly were able to differentiate themselves. You had the challenger going after the incumbent. I, I think what we're seeing in the governor's race is what we're not seeing in the presidential race, and, and that's the, the optimism that uh, Governor Gary Herbert is selling as, as the Republican incumbent. Uh, I think that's what Republicans here are looking for at the top of their ticket, too, that if we get a Republican in office uh, at, the, at the White House, we will see the country, make America great again tries to get at that, but the candidate himself talks constantly. We heard this in mm -hmm. the debate about how bad things are. We, we didn't hear as much of that in this debate, that the challenger Mike Weinholz uh, differentiated himself on positions, medical marijuana being one, Medicaid expansion, as Glenn was saying, but but not in a way that said Utah is in a terrible place and we've got to dig ourselves out. Mm -hmm. 
That'd be a tough sell. Uh, exactly. If you look at the the uh, way things are going in the state of Utah, we have a strong economy. Uh, of course, not everyone is benefiting from that, but also it's a tough sell that we need a change in that position. Uh, Governor Herbert is popular. Uh, Morning Consult recently gave him a 65% approval rating. We've seen it as high as the 70s. So just like Jonathan Johnson found out in the primaries, that's a tough sell to try to tell Utahns that we need a change in that position. Right yeah, now. I thought he made really emotional pleas that were very effective on the medical marijuana issue mm -hmm. and, and on the Medicaid expansion issue. I think that he, at one point, he looked visibly shaken, you know, like very worked up, very emotional about these issues, very invested. Um, I think that that um, really came through because a lot of people in the Utah environment support medical marijuana and they support that legalization. I think um, he had a harder time nailing down Herbert on education. I mean, education has been the centerpiece for Herbert's budget for how many years now? Mm -hmm. I mean, a long time. Mm -hmm. And so um, <laughs> criticizing there, but uh, I, I thought Weinholz held his own. It's not going to be reflected yeah. in the numbers, though. Yeah, they both had mom define, clear defining moments during that hour. But yeah. none of you see yeah. it changing the, no. the polling no. results very much. No, no. I, and remember, Weinholz is a candidate who's been able to pour $2.5 million of his own money into the race so far. Driving uh, back from a, an interview the other day, I, I noticed many Weinholz billboards along I-15, just as there were Gary Herbert billboards before the primary. He's just... He's doing everything he can as a Democrat to unseat a Republican mm -hmm. incumbent, but it's probably not going to be enough. Okay. Let's talk about the 4th Congressional District for just a moment. Uh, for a while, that was one people were looking at in the state thinking that might be the closest race that we have. In recent polls, uh, Mia Love is showing that she may be up by as high as 18 points, making Utah go from a toss-up district to a leaning Republican district. Does that surprise any of you that, uh, that has changed? Glenn, you've watched this from the beginning, from where she was to an 18-point lead. I think, I think that's probably the most surprising race out of all the statewide races is because we did think that one would be at least somewhat competitive. Uh, I know a, a Hinckley uh, Tribune poll in the beginning showed that uh, Owens was head, ahead by a few points. So yeah, I think it is kind of a little surprising that now polls and not just the Hinckley uh, Tribune one, but other polls are also supporting the fact that she's almost up 20 points in the race, mm -hmm. just below that now. But let me give you two points, Lisa, if, if you don't mind from this poll. Uh, it found that 34% of Utahns have an unfavorable view of Mia Love, and 23% don't even know who Doug Owens is. How do we, how do we kind of I don't think either of those things. things are surprising. I think Mia Love has always struggled with unfavorability, uh, and, and uh, my understanding of her internal polling is she's improving. Um, with with voters, uh, he does have trouble with name recognition. Uh, her campaign is running a new ad calling him by his given name, Henry mm -hmm. Douglas Owens. Um, both both campaigns have now turned negative in that way. I, I think what surprised me most about this race is that nothing has emerged as an issue. And I think it, again, going back to the presidential race, which is the center of the universe mm -hmm. this election year, that has taken all of the energy. Uh, that, that voters have for the election. And there's no room for candidates to get out there and say, I'm Doug Owens, I'm running against Mia Love for this, this, and mm -hmm. this reason. I have this to offer. Or for Mia Love to say, this is what I've done. Voters just don't have the mental mm. space to hear that, I think. It's like the biggest thing we're seeing coming out of that is that both of them are distancing themselves from their parties nominee, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we saw that in the gubernatorial race right. to yeah. an extent. Yeah, that whole time during yes. the debate, they would not even mention by name the candidate and in explaining why they're voting for them, they just attacked the opposite person. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, when you start looking at the presidential race here in Utah, uh, it should be noted in our most recent poll that Donald Trump is only nine points above uh, Hillary, Hillary Clinton in the state of Utah, which hasn't happened for a very long time. What, what do you use to explain why those numbers have remained so low? Um, I think that they've stayed so low because, um, again, people are very uncertain. Mm -hmm. Like, this is an overwhelmingly Republican state. And there's just a hesitancy to, to pin down. Well, and I mean, our elected leaders are not proclaiming their extreme loyalty. They're extremely, uh, they're loyal to party, but not necessarily to the candidate. Well, help me understand this then, because in the poll, 93% of Utah said they are extremely interested in this presidential debate. High interest, very low percentages in terms of these candidates. What do you make of that? 
uh, how can you not be? I mean, really, <laughs> there are not two more uh, different candidates mm -hmm. in experience, in demeanor, in uh, policies. Mm -hmm. I, 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 so what you've is never that, seen then? anything is, like this. Is right? this is, as sad as this is, what we're seeing is we're seeing reality television meets presidential politics. Yeah. People are interested and they're watching because they want to see what more outrageous thing is going to happen next. We but love to it's hate. It's not changing minds necessarily. No, not at all. Th that's the whole issue with Trump not getting above 40. Uh, mm -hmm. He'll win the state. He'll win the state's six electoral votes. In fact, they, I understand that they've deployed their uh, state director to Michigan because they're confident enough they've, they've done what they need to do here. But Clinton is still continuing to try to chip away at that. Mm -hmm. And that, that figure you just gave, nine, was it 93%? 93%, yes. 93% say they're interested in the race. We're not going to see that turn out on election day. No. Mm -hmm. They're just interested in the circus and everything that's going on around it to see what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. So the circus itself, does that keep people from coming to the polls, Jennifer? I think so. I think it is a turnoff. I mean, uh, I, look, they think already it, it doesn't matter. My vote doesn't count. Mm -hmm. And even if it did count, do I really want either one of these two to be my president? Mm -hmm. That's the fear of both part, uh, major parties in the state, and that's the hope of the uh, third parties. Is that mm -hmm. uh, you know this this will so uh, disenfranchise people who have identified themselves as Republican or Democrat that they'll look for an alternative. But the reality is they may just stay home. Okay. Thank you very much for that excellent commentary all the way around. That's it for the Hinckley Report. For more political analysis and news, please check out our Hinckley Report Web Extra, and we'll be back next week. Thank you and good night.